So as a historian, so bear with me real quick. Let me talk about the word abolition, okay? Abolition. Most of us do think of the abolition of the slave trade. Most of us have seen Amazing Grace, right? William Wilberforce, so on and so forth. So immediately, somebody comes to mind. They make documentaries of abolitionists for PBS. And when they make them, they, they highlight heroes like Clarkson, Wilberforce, Harriet Tubman, one of my favorite abolitionists, do on the $20 bill. That's awesome. William Lloyd Garrison, Frederick Douglass, heroes that worked to love their enslaved neighbors as themselves and change the laws of their nations. And that's what people generally think. I think more and more you're hearing abolitionist and you're thinking abortion. But when I used to give this talk, it was prior to that, and resurrecting it now, I just want to say I understand that when I say abolitionist and I praise God, some of you think those people fighting abortion. But 10 years ago, it was all those people fighting slavery. So the reason that is, is because abolition, as we've kind of talked about in my session the other night, is as a concept something that was never intended just to be about slavery, and that the abolitionists of slavery themselves believe that every age would have evils, and in every age there would be abolitionists. It also happens to be true that in every age there are abolitionists, there are anti-abolitionists, and that is because abolition is an ideology. That is, it's an ism, abolitionism. That's why uh, Pastor Dusty, he, he, gave the, he gave the talk on the ideology, the tenets of abolitionism. And in his talk, he basically laid out the tenets, but when you look down simply at it and you look at big old volumes, it's just when Christians endeavor to remove evils. Now, there's a whole lot to that, but Thomas Clarkson did not define it as the removal of the evil of slavery. It was the removal of evils. When William Wilberforce achieved the abolition of the slave trade by British Parliament, he didn't say, abolitionism is over. He said, what do we abolish next? So it's the endeavor to remove evils, quite simply, but where does that endeavor or that impulse or spirit come from? It comes from what Wilberforce called practical or radical or muscular Christianity. Various titles have been given to it, but Wilberforce, when he was at the height, we're talking about he's in the throes of the battle against the slave trade. They're petitioning. He's going year after year into British Parliament, putting forward bills of abolition. They're getting swamped the same way that our bills get swamped. Gradualists are standing up and saying, we agree, but it must be done gradually. He's in the middle of this very sophisticated battle to abolish the practice of the slave trade in his country. And what does he do? When he looks at it and he thinks about it, he says, well, I've got a problem. I can't abolish slave trade in a professing Christian country. What do I do? I better write a book. So he writes a book by the very succinct title, A Practical View of the Prevailing Religious System of Professed Christians in the Higher and Middle Classes in the Country Contrasted with Real Christianity. When Chuck Colson brought the book out, as a, as a reprint or whatever, he, he, called, he just called it, I think, Real Christianity. But I love these old, old titles because Wilberforce is trying to explain to himself and his country why it is that they can be literally buying and loading up people from one continent and selling them all over the world and treating them like animals, half of them dying or more along the way. He's like, how is this possible? And he looks and he says, it's because our Christianity is nominal. It's not real. He says, when I look at our salt and our light, and I look at the system of the slave trade, our Christianity is not real. So in the book, it's a great book, it's a great theological book, he contrasts biblical Christianity with the Christianity being practiced by the higher and middle classes. This is a cl the classes with power to show that if we would just become real Christians, that's the key, getting real Christianity, because real Christianity is in contrast with the culture of death. So abolitionism 
by the most famous abolitionist in history ends up being a call for real Christianity. And I like to say it because that might not fall right. Just reading the book and being honest about what he's doing is contrasting Christianity. That's not very, that doesn't sound great, but it's Christianity that is in conflict with the kingdom of the world. The kingdom of God type Christianity that is in conflict with what's going on. And in his context, uh, a number of things Wilberforce could, could cite, and he fought on a number of fronts and social reforms, but primarily, as we know him, the slave trade. Now, his abolitionism was like our abolitionism, and at first when he started it, him and his buddies, and they all kind of moved around each other and worked on these reforms, they were called a sect. They said that that's the Clapham sect. That was because the word cult had not yet become a usable pejorative, right? So the Clapham sect and Wilberforce and his abolitionist people were seen as these radical problem children, and they weren't as popular as we now celebrate them. They were loathed, but they pressed on and for years um, spread their ideology and slowly but surely um, got a hold of the country. Other abolitionists began adopting their principles, putting them into practice, writing pamphlets. This is Elizabeth Hyrick, who I'd love to talk about. She, was a, she, she converted to Christianity and became a solid uh, writer, proponent of abolitionism. She wrote a pamphlet, and that pamphlet ended up in the hands of a, of a, of a young man who grew up in a, in a broken household with his father left, but his mother was a Baptist and took him to church and, and, and raised him to believe that Christianity was something that was serious and the word of God was serious. And so by the time the principles of abolitionism had come across the pond into the United States of America, the abolitionists of slavery in America being primarily led by men like William Lloyd Garrison that I talk about had to develop and apply abolitionism in their context. They weren't abolishing the slave trade. They were abolishing slavery that was going on in their midst. All of the pillows and sheets in the north were produced by cotton that was picked by slaves who were treated like animals. They would walk around and there would be auction blocks. They saw this, it was all around them. It was different than the British context. And they looked at the culture and they said, our culture is wicked and it's abhorrent. And I refuse to go with the multitude, to do or allow grave evils is what William Lloyd Garrison said when they asked him, what is your abolitionism? He said, I refuse to go with the multitude to do or allow grave evils. And I like to say that people often go like, man, that guy's really poetic and he's really smart and he's a plagiarist. You shall not follow the masses in doing evil, nor shall you testify in a dispute so as to turn aside after a multitude in order to pervert justice. This is just Exodus 23, 2. This is just the law of God. He's saying, I refuse to go with the multitude to do evil and pervert justice. So abolitionism is just simply, if you're looking for some kind of a biblical definition, it's Exodus 23, 2 ism. That doesn't fall off the tongue very well. If you look and study what the abolitionists did, for those of you who are street preachers, you're welcome because they were the the people who really got that going and popularized it among things like passing out pamphlets and handbills and so on and so forth because it was following the print revolution. But abolitionists would stand up in their cultures in the parking lots of their day and age and they would stand before their cultures and they would say things like this. This is a picture here of an abolitionist. The nation is full of blood, of innocent men, women and babies, full of adultery and concupiscence, full of blasphemy, darkness, and woeful rebellion against God, full of wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. As I said, William Lloyd Garrison was a plagiarist. For that comes from Isaiah chapter 1, 4 through 6. Sinful nation, a, peace, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They are gone away backward. The whole head is sick. The whole heart is faint. 
from the sole of the foot even to the head. There is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. So the abolitionists are just looking at their cultures, and they're looking at it through the eyes of the prophets, and they're saying, I know that Isaiah was railing against his culture for the shedding of innocent blood, and my culture enslaves people and breaks up families and whips and maims and rapes and does all manner of evil things to my enslaved or African neighbor, but I see the same thing that Isaiah saw. So I'm going to use the same words, and I'm going to call the culture to repent in the same way. And they were not appreciated. Of course, when we look at Isaiah 1, 4 through 6, it looks pretty bleak. But when you go a little further down to Isaiah 1, 16 through 17, you have the full-throated removal of evil's passage in the Word of God. The same one that Thomas Clarkson cited in his abolitionism is the removal of evils. Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes, cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, and plead the widow's cause. So if you're looking for what is abolitionism, it is Isaiah 1, 16 through 17-ism, if you prefer that over the Exodus version. So that is abolitionism. And you might say, well, maybe that was just one particular abolitionist. No, it was the movement. Despite what you've been told by seminary professors or the writers of books who go from town to town saying all manner of evil things about people who serve the Lord, this word, this rebuke, the word of God was on the tongues of all of these abolitionists. My favorite document, if you're going to read one document written in the mid-19th century, read Frederick Douglass's What to the Slave is the Fourth of July. I don't believe that it's scripture, but the Holy Spirit got a hold of this brother when he wrote this. And he says, in the language of Isaiah, the American church, because the passage in Isaiah was written to a religious people, might be well addressed Bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. New moons, Sabbaths, calling of assemblies, I cannot endure them because I cannot endure iniquity even in the solemn meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hates. They are a trouble to me. I am weary to bear them. And when you spread forth your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. When you make many prayers, I will not hear for your hands are full of blood. And then boom. Boom. The hope, the fact that they can repent. What does the prophet say? Cease to do evil, learn to do good. Correct the oppression, relieve the oppressed. So, to begin with, abolitionist. As we've sung in that song, isn't it a bit culty you come to an abolitionist conference and they make you sing, I am an abolitionist, over and over and over again? It's intentional. Um, Somewhat. But it's because, as the lyrics in that song, there's like, in the trial hour, you have the opportunity to say, I'm not one of them abolitionists, and deny it. And there have been things that have been said about the abolitionist, and I will attest to you, as someone who's read more books on the subject than probably anyone in the room, the attack on slavery, this quote from Mary Turner, can be found in literally every secondary source that's covering the abolitionist. The secular, humanist, pluralistic, modern, liberal, historian, scholar will admit in their scholarly works that the attack on slavery was formulated in religious terms and from the first to the last, practicing Christians provided leadership for the cause. You may have heard it was Unitarians and Deists and all these things, but really what it was is a very small number of them were crazy heretics, just like a small number of us are crazy heretics. And people who disagreed with them go way out of their way to find the heretics inside them as though they're representative of everyone else, because this is the way Pharisees work in every age. But as Mary Turner writes in her University of Illinois Press 
uh, article, it was religious practicing Christians. And that is because if you look at their proceedings, their notes, their meetings, transcripts of meetings like the one we're having, their thing was to say that slavery was sin, always, everywhere, and only a sin. And when they used the word slavery, they meant chattel slavery, the buying and selling and treatment of people as though they are not image bearers but animals. They looked at slavery. They saw people measuring up other people. They saw them selling very frequent image of the abolitionists was often to show an auction block where a mother was having her child sold away from her or she was being sold away from the child. The abolitionists were Christians. They thought that the family was very important and should not be torn asunder. They looked at the, weep, the maimings, the, the, the way that the slaves were being treated as though they were beasts of burden, that the slaves were crying out for justice in a culture that was filled with churches and religious people, professing um, Christians who met and did all the right things but would refuse to practice discipline. They opened up the table, as Dusty talked about at the rally, and they let people who owned other people take the Lord's Supper. And abolitionists looked at this and they said, what in the world is going on? And then they looked at the, the, the state and the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution and they said, we are hypocrites. And so the abolitionists in the 1830s, and it took a long time for these people to really come on the scene in an organized fashion, stood up and they said, it's sin. Always and everywhere sin. This is not something that we want. We are a Christian nation. So what happened with the abolitionists when they came on the scene in sort of the 1830s? Well, they had distributed a bunch of pamphlets, and a bunch of pamphlets were distributed about them. Attention, southern men, down with abolition. Meet at the Presbyterian Church at 7 o'clock. This is a handbill. It doesn't say meet at, it says meet at Schneider's. That's not Schneider's Presbyterian Church, but this was a handbill that was sent around to rally up people to go and destroy the abolitionist press. We don't like what they're doing, and we are Christians, and they are heretics, and we must put them down in this infernal doctrine. Uh, Pictures would be printed in the press depicting William Lloyd Garrison as somebody who was getting the doctrines of abolition and the the, uh, claim that slavery was a national sin from Satan himself because the African had been created by God to be subservient to the white man and he was maybe made in the image of God, but. And so they said... The religious authorities of the time said of the abolitionist that they are following not Christ, but Satan. And in response, the leaders of the abolitionist movement said things such as, well, it appears to us a self-evident truth that whatever the gospel is is designed to destroy at any period of the world, being contrary to it, ought now to be abandoned. Whatever the gospel has been designed to destroy should be abandoned. Beriah Green, one of the, he's not as famous, but he was a very influential abolitionist. He's actually where I, I stole the whole idea of the tree and the axe and all that kind of stuff and the comparing of, from this brother, Beriah Green, um, a seminary professor, said, for one, this is after he converted from the, the pro-life of the day to abolition, it says, for one, I cannot escape from the conviction that our Savior has presented to us this very case of our colored brethren in the 25th of Matthew and pointed them as his appropriate representatives. And when we're called to give an account for not relieving these poor brethren, the plea of ignorance will be of little avail. He came under the conviction. He said, when I look at the word of God and what we're doing, and if you know Matthew 25, that's where Jesus assembles the sheep and the goats. And he says, to the goats who come before him, and say, Lord, Lord, we've done many great things in your name. And he says, depart, I don't know you. You didn't help me when I was poor and hungry and being oppressed and trod upon. I don't know you. And they're like, but we know you. We did many things in your name. These are not agnostics. They're not, these are church people. These are religious people who've put religious buildings and written religious books, and they've done many things in the name of Christ, and yet, in his sermon, he says, depart. But there are the sheep. And how are the sheep known? They keep the commandments. 
And those commandments are not a burden, and they're to love God and love neighbor. We've had many preach on that, and I'm getting off. But it's that thing. It's that, it's that Christian impulse to study oneself, one's culture, the word of God, and to say, am I loving my neighbor? Am I being salt? Am I being light? Now, as the Spirit of God got a hold of guys like Beriah Green, who ended up losing his position at the seminary, at the college that he was at, um, because he, he started an abolitionist group and they caused all sorts of trouble and uh, got kicked out. Um, guys like this, they said, well, we got to have a movement. Well, what was the first thing they said that they ought to do? A bunch of Christians saying we're going to destroy an evil. What's the first thing that we ought to do? Well, this is John R. McKivigan. This is, a, this is probably my favorite secondary. By secondary, I mean scholarly historiographical work on the history of slavery. It's a book called The War Against Pro-Slavery Religion, where he details the religious beliefs of the abolitionists, and he contrasts them with the nominal Christian or unbiblical Christianity of the religious leaders and the institutions. He, he notes, after studying all of these folks, that the conversion of the churches to the cause of immediate emancipation was the earliest and most persistently pursued goal of the American abolition movement. And that has been the earliest and most persistently pursued goal of the American abolition movement today because we know that abortion sin, the answer to the sin is the gospel, and the church has the gospel. So, of course, it would be our persistent and immediately pursued goal to get the churches involved. And praise God, they are rising up every day. Different talk, but it's awesome. So the abolitionists, just to, just to make this very clear, their standard was Christ. They revered the scriptures. Their trust was in God. They were aiming to walk in the footsteps of the Son. And it was their joy to be crucified to the world and the world to them. This is William Lloyd Garrison towards the end. This is a guy, um, you know, it's a bit arrogant of me because I don't even think I could, un, you know, do anything with his sandals. But this is a guy who probably more than anyone in the 19th century, you know, had to endure like 10 times the kind of slander that I have to endure. And I may be worse than him in many fronts, but I, I really resonate with this brother because he's always being called a fanatic or a radical or too mean or too harsh. And towards the end, he said, my fanaticism is to make Christianity the enemy of all that is sinful. And my infidelity is to preach Christ and him crucified. And so the masthead of his liberator the Liberator podcast is named after this, this publication. It was a publication that, that was influential in the cause at that time. The masthead, if you look at it, is in, in, in keeping with this, making Christianity the enemy of all that is sinful. Sorry for the second commandment violation. Christ coming onto the scene with the verse, I come to break the bonds of the oppressor, with love thy neighbor to both sides, separating interposing between the slave and the slave master. But what does all this slavery stuff have to do with abortion? I think the first time that I wrote this talk, it was to people who didn't know what I was really talking about, and I, I labored not to use the word abortion until we got here, because I thought they'd be sitting there like, I came to this abortion conference, and this guy's talking about slavery. So that's why that's there. Because I think all of you, as I speak about these things and about these, these um, brothers from old, know what this has to do with abortion. But I do want to say that slavery and abortion are not the same thing. They're not the same thing. They are different evils. They really are. And one, you've got the dehumanization of image bearers, the destruction, putting them in bonds, buying, selling, destroying at whim. Very wicked evil. Abortion's a different kind of evil. It's not enslaving people. It's killing them before they're born. It's murdering people. It's making murderers out of mothers and fathers. But they are different evils, but they're both. So I'm not trying to make an analogy. Do not go, what, do not go and try to make an analogy saying slavery and abortion are the same thing. That's not what I'm saying. 
I'm saying every age has its evils, every age has its abolitionists. But slavery and abortion are both grave evils predicated on the dehumanization and domination of man. They're in the same category of evil. Furthermore, slavery and abortion are both practiced under the covering of unjust laws and decrees. Another similarity between slavery and abortion is that back in the day when slavery was being practiced, a majority of the people living in the 19th century believed that the right to own slaves was constitutional, a majority. Now, sadly, if you look at the Constitution when it was first written, it was. There were three places in the Constitution protecting slavery and giving a benefit to slaveholders and prohibiting those who would help fugitive slaves. And so, rightly, Americans believed that slavery, even if they thought it was wrong, was constitutional. So when the abolitionists came on the scene and said, this is wrong, they said, but it's constitutional. And that is similar with abortion. Today, a majority of the people living today believe that the right to terminate humans in the womb is constitutional. But as we've talked about in the previous talks, it's not constitutional, it's a different thing. Today, we treat Supreme Court rulings as though they're the law of the land when we shouldn't, and people therefore call it constitutional. So that's one way slavery and abortion are the same. Another way is that slavery and abortion, both with slavery, you had different approaches to fighting slavery. Lots of debates about different tactics and strategies and approaches on how to fight slavery. Well, that's true today. In abortion, there are different approaches to fighting abortion. So if we want to look at the, the past here, and this is the historical part where you just have to say, wow, okay, I'm just going to have to trust him because he's not putting all these footnotes on there. The footnotes are there. But back in the day, in the 19th century, you can find this. I think they're even starting to reveal this in you know, History Channel programs and so on and so forth. There really were two primary strategies or primary groups who were anti-slavery. One group were gradualists. The other group were abolitionists. Now, at that time, um, the abolitionists would call themselves abolitionists, and the gradualists may call themselves sometimes gradualist, uh, sometimes gradual abolitionists, sometimes just anti-slavery, but sometimes they call themselves abolitionists. So I don't want anyone to go to the literature and and say, well, there's a person calling himself an abolitionist, but he's a gradualist. But at the beginning, there was a lot of attempt to co-opt the term. But as things began to sort out and debate, these two groups really emerged and were set at odds with each other. There's the different ways of fighting the evil of slavery. So to compare them, the gradualists did say that slavery is wrong. Slavery is wrong. It's bad. And it should be gradually abolished. They said that Gradual emancipation is preferred, and that it should be voluntary and compensated. They thought that slavery should be abolished gradually, and it should be by coming alongside the slaveholders, friendship evangelizing them to where they voluntarily gave up their source of empire and economic supremacy, and that whenever they got rid of their slaves, they should be compensated. For their loss, okay? Another thing about the gradualist was they focused on amelioration and colonization. Now, I'm not using these kind of antiquated words because it's just the words that they have to use, but uh, amelioration is like they focused on trying to make the plight of the slaves softer or easier in some way. So they would, if they wrote legislation or got behind legislation, it was to sort of, um, uh, you know, help the slaves. Like, we're going to allow the slaves not to work on Sundays, or let's allow slaves to read, or, or let's, um, let's say that if you whip slaves, you've got to use a certain kind of whip, and you can only do it a certain amount of times. And if you, you know, rape your slaves, you have to do certain things for the children. Let's make it better for them. And they also focused, and this was the focus of their charitable work, what they would raise money for. Um, they didn't fill up baby bottles, but uh, they passed around, you know, baskets and raised money. And it was for something called colonization. And that was a strategy of gradual amanumission, that's freeing of the slaves, and then deporting them back to Africa 
or to some colony in Liberia. And that way we can get rid of slavery and slaves. Because the, the nation really was racist and they didn't want them around. And even the gradual abolitionists said, we're going to focus on helping them and we're going to focus on paying to, to remove them. In the meantime, while we waited on the gradual abolition of slavery. Now, the abolitionists, on the other hand, contrasted with that. They come on the scene and they preach. Slavery is not just wrong, but it's sin. And as sin, it should be immediately abolished. Like Christ says, when you've got sin, you cut your hand off. Your hand's causing you sin. You gouge out your eye. Nineveh wasn't called to gradually repent. Judah wasn't reading the law and gradually repenting. Their biblical view of sin, seen and understood, once you see it as sin, you repent of it. Any sin that you have in your life, this is side, this is free. Any sin that you have in your life that you try to fight with gradualism is a sin that will continue to own you. Because it's not repenting. Because you're always leaving an occasion for sin. I speak from experience. But these abolitionists said, I know it's hard, but Isaiah says cease to do evil. And there may be some learning to do good, but we have to cease to do evil. We don't have to gradually stop being a little less and less evil. Gradual abolition is not what we want. We want immediate abolition. And this is why they ended up being called abolitionists. And they focused on immediate emancipation. And they didn't think that it should be voluntary and compensated. They thought it should be compulsory and uncompensated. If anyone should be compensated, they said it should be the slaves. They should be freed, protected by law, and paid for what they've been robbed. Very different. And their focus wasn't on amelioration and colonization. Their focus was on establishing justice. And in the meantime, they tried to help slaves to freedom in defiance of federal law. They called for the total and immediate abolition of slavery. And at the same time, they worked the Underground Railroad trying to help slaves to freedom. They did do missionary works. They did try to get the gospel. They tried to get the Bible. They tried to teach. They did those things. Just like all of us call for immediate abolition and also go to the mills. Try to rescue those being taken away from death. I'm getting ahead of myself. But they focused on establishing justice and helped in the meantime. So these are the two, two groups. Now, the two groups sharply had a disagreement. And that was that abolitionists said slavery is a crime. Now, when Bradley was speaking and he was saying, like, they're going to excommunicate you. And he brought up the thing. What did he bring up? If you say slavery is a crime, or abortion is a crime, they will say, that's not pro-life. I actually talked to another lobbyist today, uh, one of these uh, guys who's always at the Capitol. He'll lobby for anything uh, if he's being paid by the whatever the organization. And I was like, so what do you guys think about all this stuff? And the lobbyist looked at me and he says, I'm pro-life. He was like really mad. He's like, I'm pro-life. And I was like, well, okay, okay. okay. Um, well, what do you think about it? He's, I'm not an abolitionist. I'm pro-life. I just wanted to hug him, say thank you for understanding. That's so refreshing. Can you and I go talk to Greg McCourtney together? No. This guy got it. And the thing was, and it's, we all heard it in, in and out of these offices. You know what I don't agree with in your bill? It criminalizes it. It treats it as murder. It seeks justice, and that requires punishment. The abolitionists said slavery is criminal. In their first declaration of sentiments, they wrote, Every American citizen who retains a human being in involuntary bondage is a man-stealer. And that because slavery is a crime, the slaves ought to be instantly set free and brought under the protection of law. They called it man-stealing because in the law of God... In Exodus, in the book of Moses, he says man-stealing is a capital crime. It's in the word of God. You can't steal people. They're made in the image. It's a capital crime. And so the abolitionists would say, we're trying to criminalize this. It's evil. That's what our laws should be. But 
they would preach the gospel and say, we say it's a capital crime, but as for me, I say go and sin no more, Garrison wrote. He was the author of this document as well. They said it was a capital crime. This was a huge, this was the distinguishing feature between the abolitionist and the gradualist. And that's because the abolitionists were truly anti-slavery. Truly. But not only were they anti-slavery, they were also anti-gradualist. And this is a sticking point, and it's been a sticking point. You abolitionists, it's great. I like you all right, but why do you spend so much time fighting the pro-lifers? Well, there's a reason. We can go into that more. But the abolitionists at this time, in this same document, now it's, it's 1833 and uh, slavery's been legal for a long time and many, many attempts to gradually abolish slavery have been put forward. And the abolitionists come on scene saying it's a sin and a crime and they say we regard as delusive, cruel, and dangerous any scheme of expatriation which pretends to aid either directly or indirectly in the emancipation of the slaves or to be a substitute for the immediate and total abolition of slavery. They hated the gradualist schemes because they were delusive and cruel and they were dangerous. They were keeping slavery from being abolished because they were put forward as substitutes for what ought to be done, and that was abolition. So, again, this comes from the doctrine of sin in, in the Word of God because they argued, this is some young men who were following Beriah Green, said the only proper remedy for sin, for the sin of slaveholding, must be found in the immediate, full, heartfelt respect of those rights in the invasion of which this monstrous crime consists. Every slave ought to be immediately and unconditionally emancipated. So the abolitionists were not just anti-slavery, they were anti-gradualist. And the gradualists were not just anti-slavery, they were anti-abolition. They were the people gathering people up. When you see pictures of uh, abolitionists being tarred and feather, or their printing presses being thrown into the Mississippi River, you, hear, you see burning buildings. They burn down huge, beautiful buildings in Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania Hall. You, know. you say, who's burning those down? Those are all in the north. Anti-slavery people. The same people killing our bills. They don't burn down our buildings anymore. I, I want to say yet, but I also want to say dat post mill. But the gradualists were anti-abolition. So, gradualists versus abolitionists. And that, I think, I've, I've, I've drawn the line of the two things that are really going on. And I love this quote. This is one of the things that I, I read very early on. I think 2011 or so. I was reading a book. Uh, a well-respected, uh, prize-winning author, historian, scholar, William Lee Miller. It's a book, from, it's called The Attack on Slavery. He writes, a significant number of Americans underwent a kind of moral conversion. The new moral perception was not only that slavery was wrong, many had been saying that for years, but that its wrongness had the highest priority and that the ways its wrongness had been opposed heretofore had been profoundly inadequate. He's explaining this. He's talking about the 1830s at the rise of the abolitionists. He said that all these people came on the scene and people have been saying slavery is wrong, but these people seem to think it was so wrong that they ought to be doing something about it all the time. They integrated it into their lives. And they weren't only fighting slavery, but they were saying that the way that slavery had been fought was inadequate. He goes on to say that the essence of the agenda with which these potential martyrs in the cause went out to face a hostile country was not only the immediate end of the sin of slavery, but also the rejection of the American colonization society. If you're like me and uh, you've, you've, you've looked at the online, there's the Liberator, you can look at all the issues. One of the criticisms of that paper, which Garrison said, that he found to fight slavery, he was often criticized, said, your paper fighting slavery seems to be fighting the colonizationists more than it's fighting the slaveholders. And he said, that's right, because the colonizationists, 
The gradualists are the ones keeping it from being abolished, and they're the ones that I'm trying to convert to our cause. James McPherson, who won the Pulitzer Prize a few years back for his book on the Civil War, in his section where he um, was talking about abolitionists, and this is, a, this is a debate that's been settled in the historiography, he said, we historians, this is in an introduction, he says, he says, we historians, we need to stop calling anybody who is anti-slavery an abolitionist. We need to be clear. There were abolitionists and there were gradualists. And so he writes, and this is so profound and true and good that this is actually quoted on the Wikipedia page on the abolition of slavery. He says, one who before the Civil War had agitated for the immediate, unconditional, and total abolition of slavery in the United States. So abolitionists, what I'm telling you, is not strange or unconventional. It meant the ones who were for immediate, unconditional, total abolition. So you had the gradual abolitionist and the, and the abolitionist. And the distinguishing features, let me just run through them really quick. Abolitionists, you read their literature. They are committed to a principle of never calling evil good and good evil. They were committed to the principle to never do any evil that good may come. For those of you who love your major prophets, this is Isaiah 5.20. And Paul has the never do evil that good may come. It slipped my mind. But they, they were committed to these principles because they were Christians. And chief among them in their belief was that we can never compromise with evil. And that's why they were a minority. Throughout this period, they were always a minority. Because it's always a minority that refuses to go with the multitude to do evil. The multitude, just like it says in the word of God, goes to do evil. The gradualists, on the other hand, they said slavery isn't sin. It's wrong, but slavery isn't sin. We know they said slavery isn't sin because they let slaveholders take the Lord's Supper. And they hated the abolitionists for calling on church discipline for slaveholders which is why we have splits in the Baptist church and splits in the Episcopal church and all these different things. But the abolitionists said, we want you to practice church discipline on the sin of slavery. And the gradualists said, listen, we agree. Slavery is not good, but it's not sin. They're welcome at the Lord's table. They also said that we must allow slavery for a time in order to accomplish gradual, peaceful emancipation. They made arguments that we can't abolish slavery quickly, speedily, or overnight because it'll throw the country into some kind of economic disarray. We have to educate people as to the freedom that they should have, and then we have to do something to deport them and so on and so forth. It must be gradual, and it must be peaceful, and we must do it on our own time. There's a certain goodness to gradualism. And their principle was that compromise was key. That if we want to get something done with the South, we have to compromise. And for those of you who studied the, the, the writing and the ratification of the United States Con- Constitution, um, following the Articles of Confederation, the, the, the little coup that took place, <laughs> that's a side thing, but when they got together to write the Constitution, there were a group of covenanters, there were a group of these Presbyterian abolitionists early on that wanted the Constitution to include Jesus Christ, and they wanted the Constitution to abolish slavery. And the framers that we often appreciate for various things said, we don't want you as a part of our convention, and we don't want Christ in the Constitution, and we don't want slavery abolished because we want the southern states. So there's a lot of debate and so the, those who didn't like slavery believed that to get rid of slavery, we must compromise with evil to get it in the end. So anti-slavery gradualist and anti-slavery abolitionist. So let's look at abortion. And I'll go quickly here. Today, they don't go by the term gradualist. It's a dirty word. If you watch the uh, Amazing Grace, the William Wilberforce movie, um, the guy who stands up, a uh, little you know, guy, Henry Dundas, he stands up, if you recall, and they're trying to get him on the side of the abolitionists of slavery, and he stands up, and, you know, William Wilberforce and Pitt and those guys are are like, oh, man, is he going to be with us? Because they don't know. It's like, it's like, this is the time. It's like, is he coming to our side? And he stands up, and he says, I agree with the good gentleman, William Wilberforce, that slavery must be abolished, but it must be done gradually. And it's just the wind out of their sails. And everyone votes for the gradualist bill. 
So gradualist has become a pejorative. They don't like that term. Pro-lifers don't use it. Anti-abortionists today go by the term incrementalist. It seems a little more positive. We're getting increments. We get the best that we can get. So they change that word. But like the slavery is wrong thing, you will have incrementalists today, pro-lifers, saying abortion is wrong, but their focus is on incrementally banning it. Slavery is wrong, it should be gradually abolished. In regard to the gradual emancipation, you therefore have eventual abolition. We'll do the best that we can, and eventually, at some point in the future, it will be abolished. Right now, we have to help people choose life. Now, I know we've, we don't all have that bumper sticker or t-shirt, but that's been very popular, the concept of choosing life or encouraging people to choose life. But that is akin to and analogous to it should be voluntary and compensated. The slaveholders should choose to let their slaves go free, and the mothers should be encouraged to choose life. On the compensated front, well, I've seen people offer to pay, and I've seen organizations offer to find new jobs for abortionists, but I don't want to get into a tizzy and get into that. But the focus, whoever laughed, you got the inside joke. Gold star. Emmy <coughs> Johnson. So they focused not on amelioration and colonization today, they focus on assistance and adoption, good things. But the focus of the incrementalists today, and I want to say this is a good thing because they're coming from a good place, the good heart. They want to assist. They want to adopt. So they'll be often focusing primarily in the meantime while they wait for eventual abolition and they call abortion wrong and seek to incrementally ban it. They will focus on assisting and adoption. That's why all the churches collect money to buy diapers and to buy Bibles for crisis pregnancy centers. And I don't want you to think that I'm just trashing crisis pregnancy centers. But you know when you go to Mardell and there's a little thing there that says, you can practice pure and undefiled religion before God the Father by buying this $5 Bible that we will give to the crisis pregnancy center and they will give to all the women coming into their doors. And you go, ooh, this is a great opportunity for me. And you buy that Bible. Have, have any of y'all done that? I've done that. I have boxes and boxes and boxes of Bibles from the CPC because they have so many of them. And they have closets and closets full of diapers and baby clothes. And these are all good things because the church is focusing on these things. And the energy and the money goes to these things. And those are fine things. But those of us seeking to abolish abortion are severely underfunded and don't have resources. So that assistance on all those things is great, but it's not the call of the abolitionists. Let me get to them. Abolitionists today, like the abolitionists of old that said slavery is criminal, say abortion is criminal. It should be prohibited by law. We're not calling for gradual, but immediate protection. And that protection shouldn't be voluntary or chosen by those who are taking them away to death. It should be compulsory. We shouldn't be afraid of that. The scriptures say, hold back those stumbling to the slaughter. That's, that's hold them back. Bear the sword of justice against evil doers. Forced protection and they should not be compensated. We shouldn't be founding organizations to find abortionist new jobs. They should be in jail. Or in heaven or hell. Because we would, we would preach the gospel. But those who are killing children, we should not be focused on helping them choose when we're writing laws. Which is what all our laws are. Because our focus is on, and I don't even have to flip this, it just, it's, our focus is on establishing justice. That's been the abolitionist focus. And in the meantime, rescue those being taken away to death. 
We pass legislation, we seek legislation criminalizing abortion, and we go to the abortion mills. We get on Facebook, we engage in debates and discussions to try to help as many people as we can, but we don't go to the abortion clinic and then go to the, cap, go to the abortion clinic and say, abortion's murder, don't do it, and then go to the Capitol and say, let's abolish abortion after 20 weeks. So we, we focus on establishing justice for the preborn, and in the meantime, try to rescue as many as we can. Like the abolitionists of old, abortion is criminal. That's the sticking point. That's the big difference between us. Like they said, every American, we should say every American citizen who destroys a human being in the womb is a murderer. And because abortion is a crime, preborn humans ought to be afforded equal rights and brought under the protection of law. That's what we've been saying since 2011, 2012. And that is why... People hate the abolitionist of human abortion. Because that's what we've been saying from the beginning. Likewise, we've been saying that, like they said, gradualism is wrong. Incrementalism is wrong. For we regard as delusive, cruel, and dangerous any pro-life scheme which pretends to work either directly or indirectly in the abolition of abortion, or to be a substitute for the immediate and total abolition of abortion. We get a lot of flack for fighting pro-lifers, but it's the pro-lifers and their schemes that are keeping it from being abolished. Because the church, if they got behind abolition and only abolition, would see abolition. But they're getting behind Substitute after substitute. So, incrementalism is wrong. Slave, uh, abortion is criminal. You see the similarities. Now, like I said, the abolitionists of old were truly anti-slavery. We are truly anti-abortion. Like, if you're not willing to criminalize abortion, are you really anti-abortion? Does that make sense? I'm anti-abortion, uh, Greg McCourtney says on the TV. Well, you had an opportunity to get rid of abortion. What'd you do? Oh, I protected it. He didn't say that, but that's, that's why, you know, I get in trouble. They don't like me, I think, because I'm saying what they're saying. And we also say that the incrementalist, and lo and behold, we don't have it just by supposition. We're not guessing this. The incrementalists, the pro-lifers today are literally, by their votes, by their actions, anti-abolition. To quote Abby Johnson, Abolition is unconstitutional. So, incrementalist and abolitionist. We're getting to a close here. Like William Lee Miller wrote of the abolitionists that came on the scene in the 1830s, in 2012 we came on somewhat disorganized, loud and crazy, bearded, scary, Nazi-looking symbols, blah, blah, blah. A significant number of Americans underwent a kind of moral conversion. And the, more, the new moral perception was not only that abortion was wrong, but that the way that it had been being fought heretofore uh, was wrong as well. And the essence, like it said, that the essence of the agenda with which they set out to fight the sin of slavery, but also the rejection of the American colonization society, the essence of our agenda has been the abolition of abortion, but also the rejection of the pro-life establishment. And that's because it has to be done. It's the substitute. That's why Bradley's asking you to be abolitionists. That's why we're calling this evening session Plexit. We need Christians to leave the pro-life movement, to reject the pro-life establishment so that we can abolish abortion. James McPherson said that these folks that had agitated before the Civil War for immediate and unconditional abolition of slavery were the abolitionists. And looking at this, uh, it, it reminds me of another talk that I want to give or give, and that is to answer the question, did the abolitionists want a war? Did they cause a war? Abolitionists come on the scene and they call it criminal and they say that we got to re remove them from our churches and take away the Lord's Supper and we need to criminalize it. It's man-stealing. We need to start hanging slaveholders and all this kind of stuff. Those bad abolitionists 
listening to Satan caused a civil war. That is so false. Those who defended slavery and refused to repent of the national sin of slavery caused the civil war. Because war is a judgment of God. And for 30, 40 years, the people of God, standing up in the midst of a wicked culture like Isaiah's, called for them to remove the evil. And what did this nation do? What did the politicians, what many of the pulpits do in response? They said, we will have slavery and we will not have you. Like in Amos chapter 5, they hated the men who were calling for justice in the gates. I don't want a war. I like, I'm like the abolitionists. I, I kind of hate to out myself. I hate war. I think the gospel is designed to destroy war. I don't like it. I'm not calling for war or violence. I'm not even calling for secession. I'm calling for nullification, right? There's a difference. But I believe that if we keep on calling for the abolition of abortion and the pulpits and the press and the politicians keep on rejecting us, there will be judgment. And some future historian is going to say that abolitionist was one who before I don't know what, the plagues, the Muslim invasion, whatever it is. But God cannot be happy with the nations that sheds innocent blood. And the abolitionists are calling for this repentance. And it is not us that is bringing this judgment or bringing this war. It's those who are refusing to repent. And why do they refuse to repent? It's because they have something to do as a substitute. They have the gradual abolition. But brothers and sisters, I tell you, 48 years of the shedding of innocent blood, and we say with the covering and protection of our government and many of our pulpits, does not go before God as something that he listens to our prayers and accepts our worship. His word is clear. He rejects our worship and he does not hear our prayers because our hands are full of blood. So we are trying to forestall. We are trying to, before our nation and before God, get repentance so that whatever may befall us in the judgment of Almighty God is allayed. But I fully and truly believe, and I praise God, that already a host of abolitionists are coming up to help in the cause of the preborn. We're seeing conversions every day. And I know, because I'm part of, I used to be part of this academic profession, that in the future they will write about us and they will say that the abolitionists were those who sought the immediate, unconditional, and total abolition of abortion in the United States. And their opponents were the pro lifers who kept abortion from being abolished and would rather fight them than do what was right in the sight of God. So, along with these other men, I implore you, there is no reason to continue to sustain the sin of abortion any longer. And the moment that abolitionists either outnumber or outwork the pro-life industry, we will see the abolition of abortion. So please, if you're on the fence, join us in this call, Cause for Christ. That's it.